Good morning, everyone. It's my privilege and an absolute joy to welcome you to church this morning. I'm here in the church garden alone. Beat Tower is empty. There's not the normal buzz and energy around the building that we normally have on a Sunday morning. It's not nice being here by myself. I really miss you all. I miss a lot of things about church. I miss coming in and seeing Jimmy making the toast and sitting down with the lads and talking. I miss me welcome hug of Frank. I miss me handshakes that I just take for granted. But above all, I miss the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine at the table of grace. Social distancing and lockdown for the foreseeable future for our church. It's not going to be the same. But the good news is that today, along with Christians around the world, Sunday service will still happen. We're not together, but we're all together through the medium of the internet. I haven't quite got my head around that one yet. I don't know if I've told you before, but I live in one of the posher suburbs of Sunderland, Ryep. And at our local delicatessen, otherwise known as the corner shop, I was in my queue waiting for my newspaper when a lady, probably in her mid-forties, walked in with her Bugs Bunny pyjamas on and big furry rabbit slippers. I've never gone shopping before in my pyjamas, but why not? Perhaps I've never been to church before in my pyjamas, but I know this morning that there'll be people sitting in their rocking chair with their furry dressing gown and slippers on. There'll be people sitting in a recliner with coffee and toast or sitting on a bed with their laptop. Church looks different to what it used to be. But at the core of what we do, church is the same. We're here to worship the Lord Jesus and lift him high. In my daily reading a few weeks ago, I read this lovely verse in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. It speaks of 11 kings, the authorities of the world, against the Lord Jesus. And it said this, They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And that's our purpose of being here this morning. We're in the presence of the Lord of lords and the King of kings. After all the negative news of the last few weeks, we need to refocus our eyes on the King this morning. And as I stand here in the shadow of the cross in our garden, I'm humbled to realise how much the King loved me. That he gave himself up for death on this hideous cross. That that cruel crown that's on the cross member there, he bore it and took it for my, for my sins. It was forced upon his head and the Lord Jesus died for the sins of the world. And I rejoice this morning when I remember that he beat the cross, he beat that cruel crown and he beat the grave and he rose victorious on the third day and he lives today and he lives in my heart and he is high above all and we declare this morning that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's another crown has come on in, in, into the news just lately. The medical dictionary says the word for corona is literally crown and if this crown has crept in amongst us. It's a crown of death. I hate this crown. It's a crown of separation. Grandparents can't cuddle their grandchildren. All their parents separated from their family. It's horrible. I miss me mum and me dad. It's a crown that brings fear and anxiety. It's an ugly crown. It's a beast of a crown. But it must not govern how the Christian community live. We are still called to be salt and light. We are called to blossom where we're planted in an arid landscape. And so we come this morning and we talk to our King and we ask in mercy that he might heal our nation and heal our city. We pray this morning for our leaders. We pray for Boris Johnson, who's had his own brush with death. We ask that he will seek the face of the Lord and that in wisdom would lead us. We pray for our church family and the Christian community around the city we ask, Lord Jesus, that you'd put a shield around us. We pray that you will bring peace and calmness in the midst of a storm. Remind us that you are with us. We pray for the people in our church who work on the front line, and we thank you for them, and we pray for their well-being, and we ask that you would give divine protection to them as they seek to serve in dignity and kindness. We pray for Simon as he speaks to us this morning, that he will speak in Holy Spirit power, that he'll raise us to a different level, that he'll remind us that there is hope in the Lord Jesus. 
that we serve a God who brings light and not darkness. And we pray he will speak light into our lives this morning. And we pray that he will remind us that the King is a life giver and the bringer of salvation. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you breathe life into the Christian community this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Anna here, hope you're all safe and well. Um, I've just been asked to give an update on where I'm at with my job at the moment. Um, as most of you know, I'm a children's physiotherapist usually, um, but at the moment I've been redeployed um, along with the rest of our team to help elsewhere in the trust at this time of crisis. Um, most of the children I work with are considered um, high risk and vulnerable and are therefore behind closed doors, safe and sound at home. Um, and obviously the special schools um, were the first to close in our area. So um, we aren't seeing any of those children at the moment or for the foreseeable future. My um, current role is um, I'm working alongside the local authority at the Independent Living Centre trying to support um, safe and quick discharge home, um, given a kind of rapid as response assessment um, for patients at home and then delivering and fitting specialist equipment to keep them safe um, which is completely out of my normal role out of my comfort zone and um, but so far so good it's going uh, really well so obviously as a children's physio team it's been quite a challenging and um, tough few weeks um, with a lot of worry and um, anxiety in the team of people being unsure of what they're doing, where they're going, what their new job role will be um, and, and understandably quite um, a difficult and challenging time for us. Um, but I think it's important to try and keep positive. Um, I think we'll learn at our best when we're outside our comfort zone so we're trying to see the positives in it and to, um, to keep on going. One of the positives is that teams that wouldn't normally work together are um, working side by side things that we've tried to get off the ground, um, services that we've endeavoured for years to try and get to work together um, are now able to come together in the space of a few short weeks with the rule book out the window, um, all red tape is gone, legislation is out the window and um, we're just trying to do our best to pull together um, and get things as safe as possible for our patients. So there are lots of positives to come out of this, I think, um, and I think things will change um, for the better in the future and I think we'll come out of this in a stronger position. Um, this, I think from a personal point of view I'm trying to find a couple of minutes every day, five minutes every day just to stop and think in the middle of the day and just take time out um, either to pray or to read my bible 
Um, one thing I do usually carry with me at all times at work is my Gideon Bible, which I've got here, um, which I find really helpful um, if I've got a couple of minutes just to stop and pause um, and reflect on what's going on. So one of the verses I keep on going back to at the moment is um, in Deuteronomy 31 verse 8 and it says the Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you he will never leave you nor forsake you do not be afraid do not be discouraged which is something that keeps on popping into my head whenever I'm just about to go into a home visit or a nursing home residential home of a patient who may or may not be COVID positive and um, that one just keeps on dropping into my head at the moment um, and I think it's important to remember that um, the Bible is full of verses of reassurance that God's always with us, he's never going to leave us, he's always by our side and in Proverbs um, it describes God as, as someone who's closer than a brother and who sticks with us always despite how bad situations might get um, or however long this scenario might pan out for, he's always going to be um, with us um, even in the tough times. Um, one verse that I always find handy in my uh, Gideon Bible here is um, Philippians 4 13 which says I can do everything through him who gives me strength um, which is just a fantastic verse to um, memorise and have it to have it to hand at all times I think especially in this situation um, is that we're going to get through this with God's strength um, and we'll pull together but it's going to be fine okay <laughs> so keep praying stay safe stay home um, and hopefully it won't be too long before we're all back together again okay bye Lord and Heavenly Father in this difficult and challenging time our faith can be knocked but I know that you are greater than all of this that the world is suffering right now. I thank you that you know us inside out, good and bad, day by day, whether we know you as personal saviour or not. I want to thank you that through your love and through the death of your son, Jesus Christ, that you would bring us to yourself and give us the Holy Spirit to live by. I want to thank you that he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. I pray for every person watching this video that they would know you as Lord and Saviour and you, you would sustain them through everything that they do. I pray for our health workers who are at the front line and I pray for safety as they work. I pray for our police and firemen. I pray for our shop workers and IT consultants that keep this life going in semblance of normal. I am so thankful, Lord, that the song says, I see your, word, your, I see your hand in everything that you do. And I pray, Lord, I can continue to see your hand in everything that you do. And Satan doesn't have his way. I ask this in your name, Lord. Amen. We're going to have a time now of a minute's silence. Praying for all of those workers who are working in the frontline services. We want to pray for those people who are putting their, their lives um, in well, a danger every single day so that we can continue life as normal as possible. We want to pray for those in the NHS. We want to pray for those in the emergency services. We want to pray for those in uh, delivery drivers. Uh, we, we want to pray for people who are working in supermarkets. We want to pray for people who are working in the food bank. People who continue to leave their homes every day to go to work. And so just for one minute, uh, for a minute silence, let us just pray for those people. Thank God for them and pray for safety at this time. Let us pray.
Hi everyone, it's lovely to see you, it's Johnson's here. We miss you all and it's lovely to be with you this morning. We've been asked to do a quick talk on giving. And as we were thinking about this, we've been watching on the news, Captain Tom, I don't know if you've seen Captain Tom. He's a 99 year old man who by his 100th birthday wants to raise as much money as he can by walking around his garden 100 times to raise money for the NHS. And when camera crews from around the world have come to ask him, why are you doing this Captain Tom? He always says the same two things. Well, these people, the people in the NHS, are on the front line. They deserve our help. And also, over the years, he's really benefited from the NHS in his life. And that made us think about a story in the Bible, in Exodus chapter 13, where this family decide to give to God. And the boy, the son of the family, says to his dad, Dad, why do we give to God? And his dad replies by simply saying, With God's mighty hand, he saved us. We've just been thinking about Easter time when we celebrate when Jesus Christ died on the cross and saved us from our sins. And that's why as a family we want to give to God. It's an act of worship. And Julie's going to explain it now. So of course um, we're in lockdown at the minute and the, the church building is shut. But the work that we're doing for God and the community is still very, very much happening. So if you already give to Bethany City Church, thank you. Thank you so much. We'll really, really appreciate it. If you would like to start giving or if you want to give a one-off gift, then you can do that um, in a very secure way through our church website. www.bethanycitychurch.org And click on the offering section to give your gift. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It's been five weeks with you at home and we've been loving planning this session and we hope that you'll be loving the crafts. So today we've got a very cool lesson. Why? Why? Well, last week we looked that Jesus started appearing to people when he came back to life. But there was this one person called Thomas who wasn't so sure about it. So we've got some really cool historical evidence to show you what happened when he got told that Jesus had come back to life. Have a look. Jesus came back to life. I don't believe you. He, he didn't, didn't believe, believe him. He didn't believe it. Now it's so funny. Funny. <laughs> he didn't believe them. And you know what we love about that lesson is that shows us that it's okay sometimes to have doubts or not to be sure about things. It's okay. The important thing is to go to God and to talk to God about all your doubts. If somebody tells you something that you're not sure about, that's okay. But God invites you to go close to him. We're going to show you the end result of our craft today. If you have doubts. If you have any doubts, we've made a will. You can talk to God. You can talk to God. Because Thomas was having loads of doubts about whether it was true or not. But what is really cool that we find out at the end of our lesson is that Jesus actually appeared to him and he clarified all his doubts. And actually Thomas was able to see for himself that Jesus had actually come back to life. So what do we need for the craft today? Two pieces of card, a light or a real one, any colour, tip, a pen, split pen. Split pen, we know the name for that now. A pencil and some scissors. And some scissors. It's a really easy craft. We try to come up with crafts that are very easy to do at home for you. So you need to get your piece of card and you're going to get, we chose tape just to have like a round shape. You can pick a bigger round shape or a smaller, it's up to you, but it's just going to be something that's going to help us trace a circle. You need to trace a circle on the two sides of the card, one on that one and one on the light one. And this is what you will end up with. You will end up with two circles that are identical in size. So what you need to do on one side, you need to draw a little window like that. And then with the help of a grown-up, you need to cut out the window shape to end up with something like this. Now on the other side of the card, you want to write your message. You're going to put a question mark and you're going to put, I talk to God. I talk to God. Then what you're going to do is to assemble your wheels together like this, your circles together, get the split pen and oh, with a pencil, again, do a hole it right in the middle there, get the split pen, put it on and maybe the other side, 
And this is the end result. We did a little man that is doubting there, like doubting Thomas. Then you could just put like a line at the top if you want him. Oh yeah, we did a little handle with a cellar tape so it's easier to spin it around. But yeah, we hope that whenever you hear something that you are not sure about, you don't have to believe it straight away. But God invites us, whenever we have doubts, to go and talk to him. And God welcomes our doubts and he welcomes our questions. And we would love for you to chat to God this week about something that you are not sure about. So we'll see you next week for more Bethany Kids at Home. See you later. Bye. What is faith? People who know me know that I like my sport, football, cricket and other sports, and I have faith that my team will win. Sometimes they lose and let you down, and it turns out to be blind faith. Having faith in God is so very different, because God will never let you down. There is a song that goes, yesterday, today and forever. You are the same. You never change. And I, through faith, truly believe this. 
As a family, the last couple of years for myself and my family have probably been the hardest years of our lifetime. There have been several things, the main one being the serious illness of my wife. But I truly believe that through faith, God has always been there for us. Inside there is a warm and calm feeling that means we are not alone. And the pain that we are going through is nothing compared to the pain suffered by our Lord. Psalm 23 says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This to me means what it says, that no matter what the world puts in front of me, the Lord is with me to comfort me. And without this faith that I feel all through my body, I could not have got through this. We are all going through some strange times at the moment, and there is self-isolation going on. Indeed, myself and my wife are currently self-isolating ourselves. But we both feel that we are not alone. When we have the faith that Jesus Christ is with us, I sometimes ask myself, what is the alternative to having faith? I could not imagine not having the faith and belief that Jesus Christ is with me always. Always stay faithful and trust in God. Reading from John 20, verse 24 to 29. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Good morning, Bethany City Church. It's good to see you again. There's a lovely chap who's been attending our church recently called Dave. And he's quite the musician and plays the bongos. And so we've called him Bongo Dave. And I'm sure we'll call him that for many years to come. And that's the thing with nicknames. Nicknames stick. We're going to look at a man this morning in the Bible who has developed a nickname over the centuries that I think is quite unfair. He's called Thomas and we've labelled him as Doubting Thomas. And I think it's unfair because there are two or three examples of Thomas in the New Testament that show him, I think, in quite a good light. Now the first example is in John chapter 11. This is where we see Jesus. Jesus has been teaching in the temple. He's been teaching he's the Son of God. He's been teaching that he's the only way to God the Father. And the religious leaders don't like it. So they grab him, they go and to stone him. And in true Jesus fashion, he just walks away out of the city. A few days later, Jesus finds out that his friend Lazarus is quite unwell. And so he's going to go and visit Lazarus back in Jerusalem. And the disciples are like, whoa, Jesus, what are you doing? What are you playing at? You can't walk back into Jerusalem. You can't walk back into danger. Your life may be at risk. And this is where we see Thomas, and Thomas chimes in and says this. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. You see, Thomas is like, guys, we need to let our master do his thing. We need to trust in him and believe in him and, and let, let us go to Bethany with him. And because of Thomas's faith in action, the disciples saw something quite remarkable, a man being raised from the dead. When we have faith in God, we will see the miraculous. The second example of Thomas is in the upper room where Jesus, um, he's, he's, it's the night he's betrayed. Jesus washes the disciples' feet. 
He, he tells them, I'm going to be betrayed tonight. And he says to the disciples, I'm going to go away for a while. And where I'm going, you can't follow just yet. And Peter says, well, Jesus, where are you going? And Jesus says, I'm going to go, but you can't follow just yet. Let your hearts not be troubled. The disciples have no idea. But Thomas wants to know. And again, he chimes in and says, but Jesus, we don't know where you're going, so how can we follow you? I think Jesus then smiles approvingly. I think he wanted Thomas to ask because then he says these words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Thomas was one who wanted to understand. He did not want to be ignorant of the truth. And I don't think God wants us to have a mindless faith that never doubts, <clears throat> but he respects an inquisitive mind that asks lots of questions. God respects the kind of faith that says, do you know what, I don't have it all together. I don't know all the answers, but I'm still going to trust nevertheless. I'm still going to follow Jesus. And I think this is where we see Thomas. And the third example is in John chapter 20, the, the passage that we had read this morning to us. Jesus appears to the disciples, but Thomas isn't there. Jesus appears to the disciples and all the disciples get all excited and they tell Thomas, we saw Jesus Christ today. But Thomas didn't believe them. He says, I'm not going to believe until I see evidence of it. And then in John chapter 20, 26, it goes like this. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe in me. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas understood who Jesus was and put Jesus Christ at the center of his life. Wow. So the example we have of Thomas, I think, are pretty good ones. I like Thomas. And yet, he has the reputation of someone who's a doubter. Now, I must say, Thomas wasn't the only one who had a doubt. We see, for example, Mary Madeline, she goes to the garden, to the tomb, to to, to sort out a few things with Jesus' body. And she discovers he's, he's risen from the dead. And she tells the disciples, Peter, and, and he says, I've just, the, the tomb's empty. And they do not believe. Last week we saw the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And we discover that Jesus, he, he expounds the Old Testament and shares the, the prophecy. And they still do not believe who he is. I like the story in the, in the book of Acts where we get a group of disciples praying for Peter to be released out of prison. An angel of the Lord comes, he releases Peter from prison. Peter goes home, knocks on the door, and says, here I am. The servant opens and tells the disciples, and they're like, well, we're praying. Don't be silly, child. They don't believe that Peter's being freed. Matthew 28 verse 17 says that even though the disciples, they were worshipping Jesus, some of them still doubted. Now we have to ask the question here, why did the disciples doubt? Did they doubt what was before them and could not? Who could blame them? These disciples had, had seen some pretty unbelievable events and miracles and now they were standing before a resurrected Jesus. Did they ask the question, is this really happening? Perhaps some had doubted themselves. A bit like when you pass a test in an exam and you, you look at your results and you think, cool, I, I, don't think I, I don't think that was my test results. I don't think I did that well. Do I deserve this? You see, they had just abandoned Jesus a few weeks ago. And arguably, they could have said, do we deserve to be in the presence of Jesus again? And yet it is Thomas who gets the label of doubting. And what astounds me is verse 
28, when Thomas says to Jesus Christ, he exclaims, my Lord and my God. This is what anyone must do in order to become a Christian, not just believe in Jesus Christ. The devil believes in Jesus Christ. But we must follow Thomas's lead, accept Jesus as my Lord and my God. Now I want to encourage us. I think all of us doubt in our lives one way or another. When we doubt the future, we call it worry. When we doubt other people, we call it suspicion. When we doubt ourselves, we call it insecurity. When we doubt everything, we call it cynicism. When we doubt what we see on TV, we call it wisdom. And this can be said for our belief in God. Thomas, like Thomas, all of us have times when we, we doubt God in some way, perhaps spiritually. For example, you may be asking the question right now, have I really been forgiven for my sins? Does God really heal today? Am I really guaranteed a place in heaven? Can the Bible really be trusted? Does God answer prayer? Now, if we have those doubts in life, then we will never be fully fulfilled in our Christian journey. If I'm honest, I've had doubts. When I first became a Christian, I said, well, how can I guarantee I will get to heaven? Can we really? Can I really trust the word of God? Of course. But you see, these doubts always come when I'm not strong in my prayer life. Because when, I'm, when I am praying, and I am reading the word of God and digesting it, when I am worshipping him, when I am pursuing what he wants for my life, the way that he, he answers my prayers, well, it's obvious. When I'm tight with God, when I'm at the foot of the mountain and God is the object in the center of my life, of who I am, you can tell me that God does not exist, but I will know without a shadow of doubt that he does. I know that I am saved. I am know that I am saved by grace. I know that I have eternal life because I feel his presence. I, I, I see answered prayer. I'm close with God. But when I stray from God, when I drift away, it is those times when doubt creep in. And the word of God tells us that we need to be diligent in these things. You see, the more we commit, the more evidence we see of God working in our lives. If we're not living for God, and we don't see, see the fruit of our faith, then we start to question. C.S. Lewis, the author of the... Um, C.S. Lewis, the author of the... Um, the series, the, the Narnia series, once, once wrote this. Now that I'm a Christian, I do have moods in which the whole thing looks very improbable. But when I was an atheist, I had moods in which Christianity looked terribly probable. We all doubt. But first, let me say this, that doubt is not the opposite of faith. The opposite of faith is unbelief. And that's important to understand. To believe is about being in one mind and to accept something is true. To disbelieve is to be in one mind about rejecting something which is true. And so to doubt is to be in two minds caught in the middle somewhere of belief and disbelief. So non-believers are people who have made a conscious choice not to have faith. Doubters may be uncertain about something, yet still want to have that faith. This means you can have a strong faith and still have doubts. You can be a Christian and still have uncertainty over some theological issues, say. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is the opposite of so we all doubt. So why do we doubt? Why does doubt creep in? Well, one reason why doubt may creep into your life is because we don't fully understand who God is. 
This is why it's essential to keep reading the Word of God, the Bible. This is why it's essential to keep watching church online, join a virtual home group. And if we don't fully understand who God is, then when things go against what we believe, doubt can shatter our faith. For example, if we believe that as Christians, life is going to be easy and everything is going to be all right, when difficulty does come along, our life falls apart. Jesus tells us to expect pain and hardship in his name. But the Bible also tells us that he will be with us through the difficulties and the storms. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, When the water comes, I will be with you. It says, when these things happen, I will be there with you. God is there with us now. The problem with doubting God is not down to God, but down to our lack of understanding. This is why I teach the character of God so much. Another reason that we may have doubt is when our faith is based on feelings. I believe we live in an instant gratification society. I'm, I'm a bit peggish. I'm going to nip to McDonald's. I don't like my job. I'm going to get a new job. Our feelings determine what is right and what is wrong. But this can't work with God. I understand God is sovereign, God is eternal, God is good, and God is great. And so if God is greater than us, then his plans are greater than our plans. His hopes are greater than our hopes, and his word is greater than our feeling. Sometimes you think, okay, God, you're a bit old-fashioned here. But we also need to remember that there is a big difference between God being eternal and my feelings being relevant. The third reason why doubt may creep into our lives is that we start living our life the way we want to live it and not God's way. So doubt can come in if we perhaps don't understand God, if we base our faith on our feelings, or if we um, do our own, live our life our own way. I could go on. So, but I, I suppose what I want to nail down this morning is this. How can we combat doubt in our Christian walk? Well, one example could be this. If we have doubts, ask God or others for help. There's a great story in the Bible of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was one of the last prophets. And he finds himself when Jesus comes in prison. And John's thinking, wait a minute, why am I in chains? The Messiah has come. Was supposed to be liberated. And so he goes to his disciples and says, go to Jesus and say to him, are you really the Messiah? If so, why am I in prison? You see, John had doubts of Jesus and he went straight to the source. So when we doubt, we must follow John's example and go to God. He invites our questioning. In the Bible, he says, ask. Seek, knock, test me, prove me. God wants us to be honest with him, even about our doubts. When Thomas said he would doubt Jesus' resurrection unless he saw nail pierced hands, Jesus did not rebuke him, but instead responded by showing Thomas' his hands. And in verse 28, we see Thomas say, My Lord, and my God. So if you have any doubts about something, ask God. Ask an elder of this church. Ask a home group leader. Ask a friend. Another way that we can combat doubt in our lives is to maintain a spiritual, healthy lifestyle. Now, I'm no doctor, but I understand that the body is less open to viruses when it is healthy because it can fight off minor infections before they become serious. In a similar way, a strong faith is better able to fight off doubt before it gains a foothold. So I can only encourage you, continue to read your Bible, continue to spend time in the presence of God, Continue to pray every day. Continue to be captivated by the wonder and glory of God the Father. Continue to worship Him. Continue to start your day in the right mindset with God. 
We all have doubt in some capacity. Great men and women in the Bible have doubt in God too. Thomas was a great man of God. And I proved this earlier this morning. A man picked by Jesus himself as one of the first disciples. He did great things and was bold in his walk with Jesus and yet still doubted. My point is this, that Jesus understood Thomas. He empowered Thomas. And in verse 28, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. And we understand he went to do great things. And some suggest he was even a missionary in India. Jesus understands that we too may have doubt. We may doubt our spiritual gifts. We may doubt our ability to share the gospel. We may doubt God's sovereignty. We may doubt our part in the kingdom of God. We may doubt even who we have been created to be in God's image. But verse 31 in John 20 says this, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Through the Bible, And through the presence of God in our lives, we can believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That He is alive today. That He is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. And that He is serving us today. We are serving a living God. We can believe. We can trust in Him. We can call Jesus my Lord and my God and have abundant life now and for all eternity. This is what I believe. Today, I want to encourage you that even though we may have doubt that Jesus Christ is alive, He is risen, He is working in our lives and loves and cares for you this day. So my encouragement is this, even though we may have doubt, it may creep in. Keep seeking God. Keep making Him the center and the object of your life, of your faith. So let us do the best we can, with all we can, for as long as we can, for His glory. Because He deserves nothing less. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that we are able to come before You today. That You are alive. That we are able to pray with You. I thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father, that even though we may have doubt in our lives, just like Thomas, you continue to invest in us. You understand us. I thank you that, Jesus Christ, you came to earth, that you experienced all the temptations and doubts and and fear that we experience as individuals and that you understand what we are going through. And that, Lord, even you do not rebuke us, but you continue to invest in us And you continue to want the best for us. You continue to give us your Holy Spirit so that we may grow in our faith and have that sure and steadfast assurance that you are God, that we are saved, that we have eternal life. I thank you, God, that you continue to pour your love and your grace and your mercy into our lives every day. And that if we just keep our eyes firmly focused on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, we will have abundant life now and for all eternity. We thank you, God, for this wonderful gift. In your precious, glorious name, we pray these things. Amen.
trust you've enjoyed church this morning and we pray that you have a wonderful week and I'd like to leave you with this blessing taken from numbers Aaron's blessing the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace amen